You know, the next that, that I'm aware of is a very different genre. I mean, women who became active in, in politics one way or the other, political movements, tended to write memoirs. So we have Pura Rakowski in the Zionist movement, and we have socialist, you know, and rad mm -hmm. radical anarchist women who wrote memoirs. But, but, uh, but this is a cultural memoir. This is, a, I, I, we have at home a Zeppelinist from Lipscher Schechter. You're kidding. Actually, you know, we, I have no idea how I got the book. It's nothing to do with me, but it's a similar kind of stories about life and culture and what happens when her husband dies and her children are sent away. And, and her son, I forget, became a, one of her sons becomes a famous Yiddish poet. But this memoir is, well, in this period, I mean, memoirs as a, as a genre totally took off. I mean, everybody's so there must writing. have been... Because the, the, the Masculine initiated the genre, and then everybody started. So there must have been many other women. Hundreds. Then. No, there were hundreds. I mean, I don't uh, On the same subject, wh uh, what do we know about the, um, the difference between people like this lady, who wrote in German and who was living in the Pale, uh, and on the other hand, further west in the Polish area, um, weren't women already beginning to write even novels in Yiddish um, even earlier than she starts writing her? No, there, there were, yes, yes, yeah. In the mid-19th century, we get, we, get a, we get some women who were writing, in, even in Hebrew. Very rare, but they, there were some. Was she going to write more? I mean, is there a sense that there was a volume three in the offering? Because it's still... You know, by... She died in 1916, so this stuff comes out, you know, first comes out 1908, 1909. Uh, two volumes, I, you know, I don't, I don't know um, that she was planning anything else. I mean, one of the big questions is like, why did, why did she write? It's a very, you know, there's not a simple one answer to this. There's a lot going on. It's like, you know, Freud, you know, it's overdetermined. There's so many reasons going into this. Um, I mean, for one, she was witness to an incredible era of transformation, of just radical, radical change. And she says of herself that she has this phenomenal memory. She just remembers things. And she was a writer by nature and by gift. And so she felt that she has something to offer here to write really a cultural history of this period. Um, that's one. but. If you remember back to, she doesn't just tell us, this is what my husband did to me. She says, this is what husbands were doing in this period. She doesn't just say, this is my children converted, it was a terrible tragedy in my life. She says, this is what was going on, and this is the reason. The forces of the larger culture were overwhelming. And she says, we were, she does say, not only he, but she puts herself in it too, we were at fault, we parents, though she blames her husband and men definitely more, but she blames herself too. But this is what we were living through. It's and interesting. She, does, she doesn't blame, according to, if I get it right, she doesn't blame society for sort of forcing her kids to convert. You know, that they, they didn't have an option. They couldn't get into the university. The numerous clauses was there. You know, so she rails against what they did and maybe the decision her children's made instead of what, what an unjust world we're living in, that it compels us to do that. You know, that's a, that's a good point. And, and it, she doesn't do it there. And in volume one, I don't know how many of you have ever, you know, studied Russian Jewish history or heard stories about Tsar Nicholas I, the Cantonist. I mean, evil. Just evil. That's how... That's how Russian Jews related to the Tsar. She writes about that's the period she grew up in. And she writes about some of the stuff that he did that was horrible, like the decree forcing Jews not to wear traditional clothing and the trauma to Jews and that stuff. And she writes some other things that he did. But she never blames him. She never points a finger at him. And not only that, but there's this absolutely bizarre, I mean, once I start to realize how weird she is, it, it like took me off in completely different directions. She's got this de depiction in, in well, like the last third of volume one, where she, Nicholas comes to town. It's like, you know, <laughs> Santa Claus comes to town. <laughs> Nicholas comes to town. And she's very young, and she's depicting just the visual of what the Tsar, and he brings the Tsarevich, his, his son, what they look like. 
And it, it's known that Nicholas was a fantastically good looking man, and she writes, you know, he, the, the gold epaulettes on his shoulder, and his handsome this, and his striking that, and his gorgeous whatever, and, so, and, and you go, what Jew talks about Nicholas like this? This is so bizarre, they're no one's friend. And then the only Jews who talked about the Tsar like that were Maskila. Were Maskila. Because Haskalah was backed, he started backing Haskalah. And they desperately misread what he was about, which really takes a very large dose of delusion to misread, but they did. My students keep asking me this, saying he, they couldn't actually have believed that. I said, no, no, they did. There's no reason for they, they did. They said, but it makes no sense. It makes no sense, but they did. But she talks like that. She talks like that. So on the one hand, this bastion of traditionalism, and the women wanted to keep tradition, and I wanted to keep tradition, and Nicholas was, you know, this wonderfully handsome, like, how can you talk about him like that? I, I, I do, I put in my footnotes. I quote from Yiddish memoirs where, like, normal Jews are talking about him. <laughs> Shoot him like a dog in the street. <laughs> um, so she's very, she's a modern herself. She writes in German. Well, why do we know about her at formal education? Great question from an educator. Um, first of all, she knew German, right? And she says in the memoir, she has this wonderful stuff about how, you know, the, her, her, she had a brother, and son, uh, her brothers-in-law are trying stealthily in the house to get hold of muscular literature and to get hold of Schiller and to read all kinds of forbidden stuff when they're supposed to be studying Talmud. At the same time, she says, the same mother who's absolutely phobic about Haskalah coming into her house hires tutors to teach her Russian and German. And she says of herself, and, and she makes enough offhand comments, she says of herself that she read voraciously in literature, and she, again, in offhand comments, which are more um, trustworthy than explicit ones, that she, she was reading a lot. So no, she, she had. But, but ironically, in traditional Jewish culture, it was OK for girls to do that. It was simultaneously absolutely forbidden for boys. And one of the things I write about in my introduction to volume one is that, that you know, if we, we know that, but think about it. Women in, under halacha are exempt, not forbidden, but exempt from a few, not all, positive time bound mitzvot. That we know. But in no case are they allowed, much less enjoined, to violate something that is forbidden on everybody, except in this case. It is absolutely forbidden for men to study European languages, to study secular uh, knowledge, particularly languages or literature or philosophy. And at the same time, it's precisely that that is put in the hands of girls. So to me, that is really, that is the breaking point. That's where gender is constructed, is right there. 